Sophie Tuscon de Plantier was a 39-year-old documentary producer living in Paris, France. Beautiful and intelligent, she captured the attention of anyone who interacted with her. The reddish gold of her hair offset her pale, porcelain-like skin. Her bright smile dazzled in the lights of the functions that she attended, and her stunning image was captured forever by the many cameras of the paparazzi who flanked the various premieres and high society parties she was invited to. Sophie was a single mother to her son from her previous marriage when she met Daniel Tuscan de Plantier. Daniel was a famous film producer and was well known in the French film industry. Sophie had met him at work and both got romantically involved in 1988. Daniel was 16 years older than Sophie and had been married twice before, but the couple bonded on an intellectual level with similar work interests and passions, and on June 18, 1991, Daniel and Sophie got married. Daniel lived a life filled with premieres and parties, while Sophie preferred a much more solitary and simple life. In her teenage years, Sophie visited Ireland several times and fell in love with the countryside. In 1993, Sophie bought a holiday home near Tormor, West Cork, in Skull, Ireland, to escape from her busy socialite life. The house she chose was extremely remote. It had no heating, no light, and its windows and doors rattled during windy days. She would often visit this secluded home with her son during the holidays. On December 19, 1996, Sophie decided to fly to Ireland for a holiday retreat. She asked a few family members and friends to accompany her on the trip, but no one was free as Christmas was just around the corner, so she decided to go alone. She arrived in Ireland on the morning of December 20th, 1996, and rented a car, a Ford Fiesta, to drive to her holiday home in Tumor, West Cork. She planned to stay there for a few days and then return to Paris for Christmas. On the way to her house, she stopped at a Texaco gas station to buy wood in order to make a fire. She then visited the courtyard bar in Skull and ate lunch between 3.30 p.m. and 4 p.m. before driving to her home. Upon arriving at her house, she talked to the caretaker of the home on the phone. The next day, she went into the town and brought groceries and then withdrew money from the ATM. She returned to her house at around 4.30 p.m., she was last seen outside of her house. It is believed that she stayed in the home for the remainder of the day. Later that evening, she called Daniel in France, but he did not pick up the call. However, he called her back at around 11 p.m. Daniel said they had a, quote, very convivial conversation, and Sophie did not seem to be in any way upset. The next day, on December 22nd, she visited the ruins of Dunlao at Three Castles Head. Later that day, she visited a friend and told her that she'd seen a woman at the ruins that had scared her very much. According to the friend, Sophie had said, quote, Oh my God, I saw a woman, like a white shape. Locals believe that Sophie had actually seen, quote, the Lady of the Lake. According to urban legend, the Lady of the Lake is a ghost that is said to haunt the castle ruins, and anyone who sees her will die within a few hours. The next morning, on December 23rd, 1996, at around 10 a.m., Sophie's body would be found in the laneway beside her holiday home. She was discovered by her neighbor, Shirley Foster. Sophie was found wearing a white top, lycra leggings, and a pair of boots. Her clothes were stuck in the barbed wire that bordered her home. She had been brutally murdered. She had numerous defensive wounds on her hands and her arms. She had been beaten severely around the upper torso and her head, possibly by a fire poker. She had suffered severe head and facial injuries. A concrete block was found at the crime scene, which appeared to have been used to drop on Sophie's head as she lay on the ground. There was a pool of blood around her body and blood stains on the metal gate nearby. Looking inside the house, police found the home to be undisturbed there was absolutely no sign of a break-in. Sophie's bed was not made, and two wine glasses were left to dry on the draining board by the sink in the kitchen, suggesting that someone had visited her that night. A fingerprint expert tried to lift fingerprints from the wine glasses and other objects in the home, but the results were negative. The expert could not find any other fingerprint except Sophie's. 
Strands of hair with blood on them were found between Sophie's fingernails, but a forensic analysis revealed it was Sophie's own hair and her own blood. Strangely, police couldn't find a single piece of DNA evidence at the crime scene. Police found the front and back doors of the home closed and latched. The heavy gate at the entrance of the laneway was wide open, although locals say Sophie usually kept it closed. Police believe that Sophie was attacked in her home, but that she escaped and ran outside where she ran down the laneway and tried to climb over a fence, but became caught in the barbed wire. This gave her killer enough time to catch up with her and brutally murder her. Sophie's body was found near Briars, and police believe that the killer may have been injured and could have had marks or scratches on his face and hands. In the next few days, police did door-to-door -door interviews of local people and handed out questionnaires related to the murder. A total of 50 suspects would be eliminated throughout the course of the investigation. On December 27, 1996, a local shop owner by the name of Marie Farrell told police that she had seen Sophie in her shop on the 21st of December, around 3 p.m. Marie said she also saw a man standing outside of her shop, wearing a very long black coat. She said that when Sophie left the shop, the man followed her. On January 11th, 1997, police received a phone call from a woman using the alias Fiona. She told them that she had seen a man by Kelfada Bridge around 3 a.m. on the night that Sophie was murdered. Kelfada Bridge is just 2.6 kilometers from Sophie's home. The woman gave no other information and then hung up the phone. Police traced the call to a public phone booth. On January 20th, police issued an appeal for Fiona to contact them regarding the information about the man she'd seen at Kilfada Bridge. The next day, Fiona again called the police and told them about her sighting. The call again was placed from a public phone booth. On January 24th, police again received a call from Fiona to tell them that she could not meet them regarding the sighting. But this time, police traced the call and found it to have come from the home of Marie Farrell. Fiona was Marie Farrell, the shop owner who had mentioned that she'd seen a man in a long black coat following Sophie. She told police that she did not want to give a public statement because she was with another man on the night that she'd seen the man on the bridge and didn't want her husband to know. The man on the bridge, she said, quote, appeared to be in a drunken state and was waving his arms around. Later, she said she saw the man again in January at a local supermarket and she pointed the man out to police they discovered that the man she'd pointed out was Ian Bailey. Ian Bailey is a journalist living in Skull, Ireland. He was born and raised in Manchester, England, and moved from England to Skull in 1991. Bailey worked as a freelance journalist and met a Welsh artist named Jules Thomas. Bailey moved in with Jules in Liskea, Skull. Reportedly, Bailey had a history of domestic violence towards Jules, and in 2001, he was convicted of assault. Bailey was the very first journalist to arrive at Sophie's crime scene. Bailey had gotten a call from an Irish examiner reporter named Eddie Cassidy about a murder of a foreign nationalist at 1.40 p.m. Reportedly, Bailey and then Jules went straight to the crime scene, even though there were many foreign nationalists living in West Cork at the time. According to a witness, Bailey had actually told them around 11.45 p.m. that day that he was covering the murder of a French woman. Later, when asked how he knew that the victim was French, as it was not known to the media or the police at the time, Bailey said that Eddie Cassidy had told him that the victim was a French lady. However, when asked, Eddie Cassidy said he did not know the nationality of the victim at the time and had only told him that it was the murder of a foreign nationalist. In the days that followed, Bailey wrote multiple articles on the case. In the articles, he provided details about the crime scene that were not known to the general public, and also alleged that the victim had had multiple male companions in France, and that it was possible that one of them had killed her. He seemed to steer the investigation from West Cork to France. Moreover, several witnesses reported to have seen Bailey with multiple scratches on his arms in the days after the murder. Bailey said that the scratches were from him cutting down a Christmas tree. He said that he'd climbed up to a pine tree and sawed the top off of it, and while trying to carry it down the tree, he got scratches on his arms. 
Bailey also had a scratch on his forehead, which he claimed to have gotten whilst killing three turkeys. On February 10th, Bailey and Jules were arrested for the murder of Sophie Tuscan de Plantier. He was questioned about his whereabouts and told police that on the night before the murder, he'd gone to a local pub with Jules and returned home around 12.30 a.m. He then claimed to have gone to bed and slept till morning. Initially, Jules corroborated his story. However, Jules later said that Bailey may have gotten out of bed about an hour later. Jules said that she then saw him in the morning at 9 a.m. and that he had a fresh scratch on his forehead. Bailey then claimed that he had gotten out of bed, but it was around 4 a.m. and it was to write an article for 30 minutes before returning to bed. Bailey and Jules were later released without any charges. A number of people would later come forward and report that Bailey had confessed to killing Sophie. On February 4th, a schoolboy named Malachi Reed had told police that when giving him a lift home, Bailey had said that he'd killed Sophie, saying that he, quote, went up there with a rock and bashed her effing brains out. In 1998, Bailey had been drinking with a couple, Richie and Rosie Shelley, when Bailey confessed to murdering Sophie, saying, I did it, I did it, I went too far. In 1998, Bailey was again arrested for the murder of Sophie, but he was released without any charges. In a 2003 libel trial, Marie Farrell gave evidence on behalf of the newspapers that showed that the man she saw on the bridge was Bailey. Marie said that she was then harassed by Bailey and in 2004, Bailey threatened Marie with legal action if she did not retract her statement. In 2005, Marie retracted her statement and said that she was coerced by police to wrongly identify Bailey as the man she saw on the Kilfada Bridge. In 2010, a French magistrate issued a warrant for the arrest of Bailey. However, the Supreme Court of Ireland refused to extradite him in 2012 and again in 2017. In 2019, a French court tried Bailey in absentia. Bailey was convicted of murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison on the 31st of May in 2019. Despite the number of arrests, Bailey has not been charged with Sophie's murder in Ireland, as there is no solid evidence linking him to the crime. To this day, Bailey swears on his innocence and lives in West Cork. The case remains unsolved.